Without further ado, I'll introduce you to Dr. Owen Nichols. Thanks, John. We're alive, yes. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Good to see you all here. Just a very short introduction of the relevant bits. I did my PhD in zoology from the uh, University of Western Australia. The relevant subjects that I studied were uh, included paleontology, quantitative genetics, uh, in fact I taught that, um, biostatistics, and then I worked in the area of uh, mine site reclamation where I helped uh, companies to fix up the mess after the mining engineers had uh, been there. And uh, that involved a lot of uh, research, a lot of experimental design work, and uh, basically writing papers, reviewing papers, all that kind of stuff. So similar to Sarah Jane last week, I've got a lot of science in my background and uh, absolutely love it. So tonight I'm going to talk about bird flight, specifically focusing on bird flight and what that might tell us about whether birds could have evolved from dinosaurs. So if you look at the uh, dinosaur on the left, it's a meat-eating theropod dinosaur, not very aerodynamic, and on the right you've got a very aerodynamic seagull, predominantly fish and chip eating. Now, could the one on the left have evolved into the one on the right? And if so, what would need to happen? Okay, so let's look at some of the th things that birds can do that reptiles can't. Well, you've got uh, penguins living in very cold climate. Uh, on the right, we've got navigation, which Sarah Jane did an excellent talk on last week, and uh, that, that was absolutely amazing. A couple of weeks, oh, about a month ago, we were at uh, O'Reilly's, and uh, we are avid bird watchers, and uh, we heard these crimson rosella calls and currawong calls coming from the ground about 20 metres away and it didn't make sense. We thought, what's going on? And uh, then we realised it was a uh, Albert's lyrebird. And that's just one of many species that can do amazing mimicry um, and impressions of just about anything. So if you've got a cockatoo at home, be careful what you say in front of it. Um, and uh, so, so bird brains are generally, I, I forget the actual figures, but they're significantly larger than reptile brains. So these are some of the things, and of course flight. So let's look at flight in more detail. Now, some of the uh, flight uh, things that uh, feats that birds can achieve are absolutely amazing. The uh, high altitude bar headed geese can fly at a height of seven to eight thousand metres, which is basically over the top of Everest. And the world record for a bird is a griffin rappels vulture that was sucked into a plane over Ivory Coast at 37,000 feet. Now, we would pass out well before that uh, altitude. Uh, Sarah Jane, there's your Bartel Godwit, the one in the middle, and uh, that, that she was talking about, the amazing navigation feats that they come down from on their return journey. They're just here now. That was taken two weeks ago. And they go 10 to 11,000 kilometres non-stop, and they, they weigh about 50% of their body weight when they get here. An incredible feat there. The peregrine falcons can get up to speeds of over 300 kilometres an hour when they're diving to catch their prey. On the uh, bottom left, this is for the uh, physics buffs, the, uh, the uh, light coming in from the sun hits the fish and then reflects back, and then when it goes out of the water because of the changing density, it refracts. And so if you're uh, looking or if you're a heron that is watching, uh, you, it looks to you as if the fish is somewhere else in a different position, but they work it out. We don't, but they do. They, they somehow calculate it. Hummingbirds, uh, incredible feats of uh, engineering there. Um, just, just basically they can fly up, down, backwards, anyhow. And owls, uh, I'd forgotten this one. Owls, can, uh, because they've got special um, little hairs and things on their wings, they can pretty well fly silently so that the first thing the prey knows about it, it got them, bang. So uh, they're, they're obviously amazing. Now, what are the elements needed for efficient flight? Because I'm going to only be able to focus on a couple of them. Well, imagine you're, a, uh, you're talking about an A380 Airbus. The flight mechanism, how do they do it? Well, uh, the Airbus, it's, it's aerodynamically designed, it's got wings, it's got flaps that help with direction, braking, lift. It's got a tail fin as well, obviously, for, for fine tuning of direction. And, uh, and of course, very importantly, it's got a hydraulic system that operates all the moving parts. So that's, that birds have to have the equivalent of all of that. And we'll look at uh, some of that. The power system, again, if it's a plane, it'll need a uh, jet engine or it'll need a propeller. 
but it'll also need uh, fuel and the right environment for, uh, in animals we call it metabolism, but basically the oxygen, burning the fuel, all of that. And then the control system, obviously the pilots uh, and the software that goes with it when it's on autopilot and some combination of all of that. Okay, I won't be saying a lot about that. So all of these, to get to an efficient flying machine, all of those had to evolve together pretty much um, to, to enable efficient flight. So bear that in mind when I'm talking about some of the genetics calculations. So the flight mechanism, how do they do it? Well, feathers, I'll look at feathers in detail, aerodynamic design with the birds, and um, structural design. There's many other aspects. They've got a very strong skeleton with uh, light, hollow bones. In fact, uh, for many of them, the uh, feathers weigh more than what the, the bones do. Um, they've got uh, musculature attached onto the uh, furcular. The, 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 the muscles have to be uh, strong enough to be able to um, flap the wings and for some of them obviously very strong because they've got a fair weight to lift. So the musculature has to be right and the skeletal system as well. And uh, lightweight beaks, etc., tendons for uh, acting as the pulleys or the hydraulic system, all of that. Okay, so I'm going to look at feathers, focus on feathers. Now, this is uh, a typical bird feather. You've got essentially three main components. You've got the uh, shaft going down the middle, and off that are branching barbs and then barbules. Now, if you can see it, I'm not sure if you can, but on those barbules there are these little hooks and they actually hook in place. And what that does is they make that a very strong and rigid structure so that it's effectively like a wing. Okay? Um, so the whole thing is, uh, it's, it's asymmetric, okay? And it's kind of shaped like a wing, but um, the aeronautical engineers got the idea from the birds, it wasn't the other way around. Okay? So um, the, that's, that, that's the structure of the feather. And notice here, something interesting, the occasionally they get gaps, uh, things like uh, they may have been hit by something or whatever, they can simply preen it with their beak, and you would have seen birds preening themselves, and the whole thing comes perfectly straight back into place. So it's absolutely incredible the way it works. Um, now, the uh, feather structure, the strength, I'm not going to explain that in detail. That's really just to say to your main message that uh, the, the way the bird's feather is built, it is very light but also incredibly strong with the uh, beta keratin protein that it's got. Makes it very, very strong in the layers and all of that stuff. So, so it's quite long, uh, some of them are very long in fact, but also extremely strong. Other properties, uh, this is another one of our bird watching expeditions. This is uh, up at the Bunyas. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but on its back you can see little globules of water. So those feathers actually give waterproof properties as well. If they want to be really waterproof, uh, ducks have an oil gland and they can add oil to it, but generally for most birds that gives them a certain element of waterproofing. So these are multifunctional things that the feathers have got. This one is blatant self-promotion. Um, this is actually out of my PhD. And uh, what I did was I looked at uh, birds, same species, different subspecies, one from the desert and one from the southwest of WA. So one where in very hot, dry areas, and had to survive in that. And the other one, of course, had uh, all the water it needed, no problems. And I put this in here because there's another story about the feathers. The feathers here, um, if you look at some of them, you'll see that there's some black on the um, barbules, and uh, that's melanin, that's the, the melanin pigment, pigment. Yellow, again, is a carotenoid type pigment. And blue, though, blue is not a pigment at all. Uh, blue is very interesting. It's actually a structural thing. It refracts the light. So, so the different, there are different mechanisms in the feathers according to what colour you're talking about. Now, what's the, what was the relevant of that to what I was doing? Well, in the desert, the ground gets very hot. The sand gets really hot and a lot of heat reflects back off it. This one, with its yellow on the front there, I tested and found that that reflects that heat back very efficiently, far better than what this one does. So what they've done is they've effectively adapted a reflecting system to save energy by, um, by, by reflecting the heat off them. And uh, so that saves them with, with water and all, all sorts of things. Okay, so quite amazing. So that's, that's something about feathers. Now, okay, hopefully by now you've worked out that they are very complex. And they, the question is, uh, for, for many years, people simply believed, uh, evolutionists believed that 
feathers came from scales. So basically scales, which are essentially folds of skin, evolved into the complex feathers that I've just shown you. People are realising now that that's not the case uh, and uh, there are problems with it. First of all, there are structural differences. So the uh, scales and the uh, even proto feathers, and we'll talk about them in a minute, uh, versus complex feathers, there are enormous differences. Um, so so it's, it's, it's far from simple. Uh, so the scale's going to, towards feathers. Chemical differences, the bird feathers have a uh, bit of keratin that is arranged in a way that gives them that super strength that I talked about. Information, any, any changes um, in structure and uh, any, any that involve uh, the use of um, biological compounds, proteins, need information. Again, Sarah Jane mentioned this last week. Information, mutation, selection, DNA changes required. So there's an enormous amount of DNA changes required to get, all of, get selection for all of those things that we talked about. Okay, so it's very, very difficult. What was the selection pressure for function? Um, we'll look at some examples of uh, feathers, including some with dinosaurs. And were they selected for, the, the, for heat or for display versus flight? And if they were selected for one, then they wouldn't have had any advantage for the other. So if you're talking about selecting for particular functions, you've got to realise that selecting for one does not help with another. Convergence. Convergence is something like, for example, um, water rats, frogs, um, some birds, they've got web feet. But nobody's suggesting that one of them evolved from another. That's convergence. Okay, things coming together the same, but there's without any relationship. So um, with feathers, um, there's nothing in the Bible that says that, 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 that um, dinosaurs can't have feathers. Okay, so, so a lot of the feathers that people get excited about and saying, oh, that proves evolution. Well, yeah, it could also just as equally well be, be convergence. In fact, in many cases, it's far more likely to be convergence. And of course, the fossil record, which I'll talk about later. So evolutionary biologists uh, quickly found it out and um, there was a thing that when I did zoology we used to call it ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Now what that means basically is you look at the growth system of an organism and how it worked and that tells you the story about how it might have evolved. Uh, it's a theory, there's a lot of holes in it, it's very iffy but uh, if, you've, if you've got a grasp onto something that's what you go for. Um, and we'll go through some of these things, uh, the, the growth forms, starting, starting with tubular sheath forms and going all the way through to feather unfurling. Don't worry, there's a diagram coming up. So what they're suggesting is this, this is a sequence of how um, feathers evolved, starting with A, a proto-feather, branching, something like down that you find on birds to keep warm, and then C, uh, barbs coming off, barbules happening and then eventually ending up with a proper feather. Now, one of the experts on, um, on bird uh, evolution doesn't think that's, doesn't think that's right, uh, doesn't think that could have happened. I'll quote uh, Fiducia. Findings, his findings showed no evidence of the existence of proto-feathers and consequently no evidence in support of the follicular theory of the morphogenesis or growth of the feather. And uh, he also added that proto-feathers are probably the remains of collagenous fibre meshworks that reinforce their skin. And we'll see an example of that. Okay, they're simply forming aberrant patterns. So let's see if we can find a couple of examples. And note here also proto-feathers, or so-called proto-feathers, are found in a wide range of dinosaurs, also in pterosaurs, and marine creatures with absolutely no suggested evolutionary links to birds. Okay, so they're, they're, they're clearly not the, the line that's leading towards birds. So did dinosaurs have feathers? Well, in some cases, maybe yes, but certainly not in this one. This one was put up as a good example. To start with, I got very excited about it. And there's that little lump on the back there that uh, looks a bit like a fold in the skin. That was suggested uh, it was a proto-feather. The uh, Lingam Solia, another expert on uh, bird feathers, said about that, compressive and tensile, uh, these, he described it as compressive and tensile forces acting on a clearly unified structure, i.e. a frill or a crest overlying the neck, the back and the tail of Sinoceropteryx, as opposed to individual proto feathers. He said it simply wasn't that. 
Okay, so that was, that was his view on that one. Now, something else interesting here, look at the time, that's the evolutionary time, 126 million years ago, middle of the Cretaceous. Okay, so if that was a predecessor of birds, what else was around at the same time? Well, this was. If it looks like a pigeon, uh, it's got feathers like a pigeon, it's got feet like a pigeon, it walks around like a pigeon and it's got a beak like a duck, then it must be a Archaeorhynchus. Okay, about the same time as Sinusoropterus and many other bird species at the same time. Modern feathers, bird lungs, okay, so they were around at that time. So what was the first unquestionable bird? Well, it was Archaeopteryx, found in Germany in uh, around 1860s. And nobody's denying that it had fully formed feathers, aerodynamic wings, uh, a wishbone for attachment of the flight muscles, flying bird's brain, um, so, so a larger cerebellum and larger visual cortex. Upper and lower jaws moving. Uh, when you think about it, most of ourselves in reptiles, we move our lower jaw, not our upper jaw. Birds move both. Pneumatized vertebrae and pelvis, so hollow bones, basically. It did have teeth, but so did uh, many other extinct bird species. So Archaeopteryx, Fiducia, Fiducia called, talked about Archaeopteryx and said that Paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx in, into an earthbound feathered dinosaur. But it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird, and no amount of paleo babble is ever going to change that. Okay, so he was very strong about that. All right, so let's look at a few others. Ornithomimus, a theropod dinosaur, supposedly one of the ancestral group. Now, that, there's an awful lot of license in that. The uh, reality was nothing like that, but that's, you know, the artists get a bit carried away. And that's got feathers. They are not asymmetric. They are, they are not anything like real bird feathers, but, but they are feathers of some sort, so they're possibly there. And there's also what they call proto-feathers on that. Interestingly, there aren't on, on the young as well, so they can't really work that out. Another problem, this was about 75 million years after Archaeopteryx. Now, that's an awful long time. Okay, so again, that's not a direct ancestor or nowhere near a direct ancestor. Did it have feathers? Well, the hypothesis of feathers in Ornithomimus lacks sufficient scientific rigour and depends wholly on confirmation, i.e. the tendency to emphasise and believe experiences that support one's views and to ignore or discredit those that do not. Doesn't that sound familiar? We're human, we do that all the time. Um, and, but, but that was Lingam Solar again. Okay, so he's questioning whether that really had anything, anything remotely like feathers. Okay, Deinonychus, right. If you are, um, get bored during the holidays, um, you can always say to the kids, let's, uh, let's, let's get on a Netflix and let's go and watch Cretaceous, Cretaceous Park and watch the Deinonychus running around chasing people. Because technically that's what, it's, that's what it is. Hollywood, of course, you know, you know Hollywood always tells the truth, doesn't it? Um, Hollywood called it Jurassic Park. It's nowhere near the Jurassic. It was in the middle of the Cretaceous. And the velociraptors you saw running around weren't velociraptors at all. They were too small and friendly. These things, Deinonychus, were much more scary. But you can't go into a shop and ask for a Deinonychus. So did it have feathers? Yeah, well, it kind of had a few um, feathers on its arms, but they certainly weren't for uh, flying purposes or even adapted for that purpose. Um, what, did, what did the uh, curator of birds at the National Museum of Natural History in the Smithsonian in the US say? Well, he was getting a bit sick of museums putting up um, displays with feathers everywhere. So, uh, so the, he, t he said the hype about feathered dinosaurs in the exhibit currently on display at the National Geographic Society makes the spurious claim that there is strong evidence that a wide variety of carnivorous dinosaurs had feathers. A model of the undisputed dinosaur Deinonychus and illustrations of baby Tyrannosaurus are shown clad in feathers, all of which is simply imaginary and has no place outside of science fiction. Okay? So were there any that were about the same time as Archaeopteryx? Well, yeah, there were. There was uh, Anchiornis, and that was a pretty similar time. That was possibly five to ten million years before Archaeopteryx, but in, in, in evolutionary times, not much. Um, it had some feathers, they were symmetric, not asymmetric. On its wings and its legs, it could possibly glide, but it certainly wasn't capable of flapping flight. 
and there's no suggestion that it had all the other, uh, other bird features necessary for flight. Some have debated whether it's a dinosaur or a bird, but it's 30 million years older than the next youngest and more dinosaur-like troodontid. So you've got to start thinking there, hang on, did they evolve back into something that wasn't like that? What's going on here? All right? Oh, and Proto Avis, I haven't talked much about that because there's some question about its validity, but uh, one, one person found one of them that was at least as birdy as what Archaeopteryx was, but it was many, many tens of millions of years older. So, so again, they're all about the same sort of time, but again, that's questionable, so I haven't relied on that. Okay, so conclusion from the feathers bit. Feathers, uh, in my view, uh, based on that evidence, I don't think feathers provide strong evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Okay, part two, the bird's power system, the engines. What have they got? Well, uh, they're predominantly all warm-blooded, they have four-chambered heart, and they've got flow through lungs, and it's the lungs that I want to focus on, that's the really interesting bit. Reptilian lungs, they're similar to ours in the basic structure, they've got the um, glottis and the trachea, and they've got um, basically a rib cage, and uh, bellows lungs. So the air comes in, it goes out. Not super efficient in terms of mixing, but it's certainly good enough, it serves the purpose. And it works for us, it works for all mammals, it works for all the reptiles, no problem. Birds is completely different. Now, uh, I presume we've probably got one or two engineers here, you'll, you'll get this straight away. To explain how the bird lung works, we need to understand how a countercurrent mechanism works. Now, this is absolutely brilliant. Um, if you imagine a seagull standing on ice, okay, the blood comes down and the, down the artery and all the way down it's losing heat. That's if it hasn't got a countercurrent mechanism. And then it loses a lot of heat down on the ice. Then it comes back up and it's already cold and the bird has to use an awful lot of energy warming it up. Okay, very simple system. But in reality, this is what happens. You have the, the vessels very close together, so effectively what's happening is you're getting heat transfer all the way, okay? So you're saving a huge amount of heat. Instead of the heat getting lost to the outside, the heat gets transferred to the blood that's coming back up the veins, all right? And so at the bottom, a lot of the heat's already been used for a useful purpose, and then it comes back, and it's pretty well three quarters warm by the time it gets back up. Okay, absolute genius. Um, that doesn't only work with heat. It works with electrolytes, you've got that in your kidneys, uh, and it also works with gases as well. Okay, so let's look at bird lungs and how they work. This is a fairly typical bird lung, so they've got hollow bones, and so there are some air sacs in, in, in the lungs, uh, sorry, in the, in the bones. That's the basic lung, which we'll look at in more detail, and they've got anterior thoracic air sacs and posterior thoracic air sacs. All right, so, so let's look at how that functions. Now this, when I found this, um, I thought, wow, this is, this is absolutely perfect. This is how well it explains it. And I'm hoping you can see the colours here. Start focusing, it's, it's a four step process, okay? Start focusing on the yellow. The yellow is the, uh, the first inspiring. Okay, yellow is oxygen rich. First breath comes in and goes into the posterior air sacs, okay? Step two goes from there into the back of the lungs. Step three goes through to the front of the lungs and into the anterior air sacs. And step four, it comes out and it's now red, which means low oxygen, high carbon dioxide. All right, brilliant. Now let's look at the, let's look at a cutaway diagram of the uh, the lung itself. So from the back here, you've got the uh, air tubes coming through, and you've got uh, rich in oxygen, and the, all the time it's passing oxygen across to the blood vessels, which are going in the opposite direction. Okay, and at the same time, it's picking up carbon dioxide because the blood vessels are coming back with, with more carbon dioxide on them. So by the time it comes out, it's got low oxygen and high carbon dioxide, and the blood vessels, of course, are the other way around. So fantastic system, and it's continuous. It's happening all the time. So it's absolutely super efficient, and that's what allows the birds to fly at you know, such incredible altitudes and do the amazing things that they do. Now, did simple reptilian lungs evolve into the complex bird re respiratory system? Well. Seriously? Um, have you patented that word, by the way, John? Can I? Do I have to pay a royalty each time I use it? No, okay, it's worth it. If yes, then how? Okay, if they did evolve into that, 
how on earth did they do it? How would an intermediate stage work? You've heard the concept of irreducible complexity. Well, here's one. Yet half of one of them isn't going to work. Okay, it's, not, it's, it's completely designed differently. It's totally different. Birds uh, have, need a fixed femur to um, hold the space where the air sacs are, so they've got to have a different skeletal structure. What was the selection pressure? Now, it wasn't flight because bats can fly pretty well. Flying foxes can fly, okay? So you can fly without one of those lung systems, all right? Um, so that doesn't make sense. Sinoceropteryx, the one I showed you before, that had bellows lungs, and Archaeopteryx had the bird lung design. So it's very unlikely the bird lungs evolved from reptile lungs. Um, Air osteon, there's a, few, uh, there's a few of them that uh, might be possible examples of, of uh, convergence or, or, or something like that. Um, Air osteon, um, that was uh, 84 million years ago, again, way after Archaeopteryx. That had some bones that, uh, that were hollow, which could have been there for a reason, to make it lighter, make it go, work, run faster, whatever. Uh, this one, Majungathorus, um, it's, this one is, uh, again, it's about the same sort of, similar sort of age. Uh, it's got some hollow bones as well, and uh, they're debating as to what, what its respiratory system was. Um, but the interesting thing about that is that that split off from the dinosaur line, not in the Jurassic, but in the Triassic, way, way, way back. So either if, if lungs did evolve for that and birds, then they were around awfully early, and uh, it's a bit of a mystery as to why there's no record of that. Uh, and also, it split off and others along that line don't have them, so what's going on? Is something unevolving? What's happening? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay, so the split was well before the evolution of birds. So conclusion, bellows-like lungs could not have evolved into the high-performance lungs of modern birds. That's Dr. John Rubin from Oregon State University. Because time's limited, I'm going to just pretty well skip through and summarise this, this bit about genetics and the mutation, but I'm more than happy to talk to you afterwards about it, OK, and some of the calculations. I'll just give you a brief summary of, of what I concluded. Five years ago, I did a talk on probability of genetic mutations. And uh, uh, thanks to uh, Sarah Jane, I, she explained the uh, DNA roughly, so I'm not going not to go into that, and the fact that it's made up of all these bases, A, T, G, and C, and it's like a digital coding program. So you basically read the sequences, that codes for the proteins, and uh, they're all the building blocks. Now, it's way more complicated than that, but um, for, for the sake of simplicity, that's what we're doing. That's, that's what we're going to talk about. Now, I decided, OK, let's muck around with maths, being a bit of a mathsophile. Uh, I said, OK, let's look at the probability of just the smallest, simplest protein being uh, produced by chance alone as a result of getting those CTs, A's and G's in the right proportion, uh, in, in, in the right order, the right sequence. OK, so the smallest protein, about 100 amino acids long, so 300 of those um, nucleotides. So I could work that out, and I decided to compare it with other, a few other things that we know about. So let's look at a couple of them. If you throw a coin 200 times and get heads, then pretty well everyone would say, hey, there's something funny going on here, I smell a rat. If you were in a two-up school, you'd want your money back. Okay? Um, the chances of that happening are one in 10 with 59 zeros after it. Uh, the prime numbers, now the movie Contact, Jodie Foster, great movie, um, that uh, said that basically, if you get the prime numbers coming in from outer space, and they're coming in the order, then that proves that there's intelligent life out there. No, it proves, OK? So most people would accept that. What are the chances of that actually happening for the numbers from one to less than, less than, less than 100? Well, I, there's a few ways you could work it out, but I worked them out at 10 with 49 zeros after it. Now, they're a lot more likely. That, that, all of us would agree that there's something going on there. There's intelligent input into that, OK? But I worked out with the uh, chances of the smallest protein, that sequence happening, uh, there's two ways of calculating it, using just the DNA coding and the amino acids. One of them's got 180 zeros after it, and another one's got 229 zeros after it. Now remember, you can take as long as you like, and you're never going to get that, because if you take 14 billion years, or 3 billion years that life's been on Earth, that's only got nine zeros after it. So you've got to have an awful long time if you're going to get that happening by chance alone. Now, of course, if you're on the ball, you'll say, oh, yeah, sure, but what about natural, natural selection? Where does that come into it? Well, 
that's what I haven't got time to get into. But uh, I will, I'm more than happy to talk, talk through that with you. Okay, so anyway, I concluded that the chances of particular mutation, the code for protein that results, uh, that results in a reptile evolving towards more bird-like species are mathematically unrealistically small. That's for any protein, um, okay? But note that they, most of the creatures for flight had to evolve together, so this had to happen many times. Uh, so, and many of them are no use half evolved, each of the lungs. Okay? So, anyway, we, we'll jump over that and we'll get onto the fossil record. Okay, so just a few, just finishing off with a few in the fossil record. Does the fossil record help? Well, not really. Even if we ignore the fact that there's a pretty booming, has been a pretty booming fossil, fake fossil industry going in China. I know you'll find that hard to believe, but in, in parts of China, they've been producing fake fossils and uh, Archaeoraptor was one of them, and it's not the only one. But let's give them the benefit of the doubt. This is, uh, some of these are from Ron. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, and uh, they tie in really well to what Ron was talking about. The birds I talked about earlier, they were in the Cretaceous. These are in the Jurassic. So these are way, way back. These are birds that are in the Jurassic. Some question about Iberomasaurus. Uh, some say Jurassic, some take Cretaceous, but the others are definitely Jurassic. And they were well before the peak age of the dinosaurs. So there were birds flying around quite happily. Some, some of them were able to, some of the dinosaurs were able to glide again a long time after Archaeopteryx. Some of them had feathers, not asymmetrical, but nevertheless they could glide but not fly very well. And they didn't have all of the bird features. So there's, there's some convergence happening there if you're um, um, subscribing to the evolutionary theory. Interestingly, I talked earlier about how many birds there were uh, around at the time of the uh, middle of, of the Cretaceous. This is way out of scale. The, uh, the, the uh, dinosaur here is way bigger than the uh, Confucius Hornus. These things used to eat them. They used to catch them in mid-air, and one of them was found with two in its stomach. So they were around. There were lots of birds around at the same time, but you don't tend to see them in the displays because it's a little bit of an inconvenient truth. And uh, many bird tracks have been found amongst dinosaur footprints. So that was happening um, supposedly at about 125 million years. Now, again, thank you very much, Ron, for this one. This, uh, you probably can't see it in much detail, but if you assume that it's a tree with branches starting here and spreading out to the various dinosaur groups and with the birds over at the right here. That's uh, one of the um, uh, gurus of, of the uh, dinosaur evolution. And, but if you look critically at that, then which bits don't have any fossil evidence? Well, the red and the blue bits don't. Okay, they're his views. They represent his views. So let's just chuck them out. And instead of a tree, what have you got? It's more like a wheat field. Okay? And you'll see a few quotes that things tend to come into the fossil record fully formed and stay that way. All right, so the fossil record is not helping a great deal there. So, summary, what the fossil record shows, well, some feathered dinosaurs were fakes, we know that. Disagreements whether some fossils were birds or even dinosaurs. Um, and some of those ones that I showed you before, there was a lot of debate about were they really a bird, were they a dinosaur? All birds appear in the fossil record as fully formed birds. Many birds were around at the peak time of the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs with bird-like feathers generally appear after many birds, particularly Archaeopteryx. Not all paleontologists agree that birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs. Uh, some believe raptors even, in fact, evolved from birds. Okay, so it's the other way around, some of them believe. No set of existing fossils shows a sequence of intermediate transitional forms that match postulated evolutionary dates. Okay, so with the birds, you haven't got the series of fossils before them that you need to be really convincing. So some relevant quotes from some of the experts. Uh, again, these are not Christians. These are um, uh, experts very strongly believe in evolution. Stephen Jay Gould said, a dominant fact of the fossil record is that the great majority of species appear with geological abruptness in the fossil record and then persist in status until their extinction. So they don't change, he's saying. Another one, fossils and other evidence is clear. Evolutionary change in avian morphology primarily occurs in terms of minor size adjustments, while changes in shape are very rare. Or as uh, Mark Ridley, another evolution, puts it, the gradual change in fossil species has never been part of the evidence for evolution. Darwin showed that the record was useless for testing between evolution and special creation because it had great gaps in it. 
the same argument still applies. No real evolutionist uses the fossil record as evidence the, uh, in favour of the theory of evolution as opposed to special creation. And that's the experts saying that, okay? So key summary points, summing up what I've talked to you about. Feathers, complex structure, make it extremely unlikely they could have evolved from reptile scales or anything else. Lungs wouldn't have evolved from a reptilian bellows lung. Half a lung is useless. Genetics, the complexity required for flight makes evolution through mutation and natural selection extremely unlikely. And the fossil record, no convincing evidence that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Okay, so uh, if you believe that, then what's plan B? Well, here's plan B. Um, unless, of course, you're going to bring aliens into it. Um, but we'll leave that aside for maybe next year. Um, Genesis. Uh, Genesis 1.21, I won't read through it all, but uh, very fruit, fruitful and increasing numbers. Winged birds according to its kind. Every winged bird according to its kind, the fifth day. And on the sixth day, um, the creatures that move along the ground, each according to its kind. Okay, so I think that pretty well sums it up.